The Slav defence to the Queen's Gambit is pretty difficult to play against in all its offshoots. And this is why over the last 25 years it's become one of the most popular defences to 1d4. To show just how difficult it is to play against, let's have a look at a game from the um, Women's World Championship currently taking place in Sochi, Russia. And therefore my game of the month for April 2015 is the game between T. Tran and Nguyen playing white and Grandmaster Antoniata Stefanova, uh, former Women's World Champion, playing with the black pieces. And in this game, we've got a variation of the Slav known as the triangle variation, where black sets up this triangle of pawns and retains quite a few options by playing this way. Black could even think about playing the stone wall. Black can play a, a semi-slav or meron formation. Black can take on c4 and play uh, the notabone variation. It all depends on what white plays next. And in this game, white played queen to c2, which I recall was an old favourite of uh, Tony Miles when he wanted to take black away from theory. Objectively, though, this move shouldn't give white very much. And... The general recipe for black against it is to take on c4 to expose the white queen after queen takes c4. At some stage in the near future, black's going to gain a bit of time against the white queen and uh, get at least equality. That's the thinking. So going back, this is why I think um, Nguyen plays a less common move here, a4. That's not to say I think this is a good move. I think probably queen takes c4 is objectively better. But I think this is an effort by white to take black away from mainline theory. Well, as usual, when white take, uh, black takes on c4 and white doesn't recapture, black's always got this option of b5 available. And so already after five moves, we've got a very sharp position on the board where black is looking to slowly consolidate this extra pawn. And white will be trying to open up the game to emphasise her lead in development. So g3. And you have to say that's a pretty logical move. Black is training her sights on black's queenside pawns. Of course, the problem for black is if this goes wrong, then the whole position can just collapse in a heap. On the other hand, white has yet to regain her pawn. So... I think justifiably ambitious play by Stefanova. Um, she's going to keep her extra pawn and try and grind white down. So white went bishop g2. And now a move which highlights the darker side of a4, knight to a6. Which curiously is a novelty in this position. But that's probably just because this line with a4 hasn't been played very much. Previously, uh, black played the knight to d7. But I quite like knight a6 because, um, well, the idea behind that move is obvious. The black knight's on its way to b4, which is uh, an excellent square in the middle of white's camp. Never mind, white dropped back to uh, b1. Black brought her knight out to f6. And you see, the move white wants to play in this position is, is e4. But she can't do this just yet because of knight d3 check. Therefore, white has to castle first and Stefan overplayed a6 and now we get quite an interesting position on the board uh, where that knight on b4 is, is really worth its weight in gold in a way it's dissuading white from playing e4 because then the knight can sink its way into d3 and if white can't play e4 then she's got to find a way of breaking open the black position not at all easy. Plenty of practical problems in white's way. Well, white played rook to d1. Keeping e4, the option of e4 on the table. And reserving the other option, really, of breaking open the black position. That's b3. This is another very common uh, move in positions of this type. White is happy to sacrifice a pawn just to get rid of that pawn on c4. This will give her freedom of movement and some chances. 
So maybe it's a bit surprising, actually, in this position that White doesn't play b3 immediately. I mean, I quite like that move here. Why waste time with rook to d1? I think this is probably the best way to try and play the white position. Black's probably got to take that. Queen takes b3. And the issue is what happens to uh, the knight on b4 when black plays, uh, white plays bishop a3. I think this would probably have been the best way to play with white. And it leads to a very unclear situation where black's a pawn up. But as you can see, white can put all the major pieces on the queen side files and hammer down against the queen side pawns. Moreover, knight e5 is a positional idea that can't be ignored. And therefore, I think this is just an unclear situation where white has some compensation for the pawn. I'm not sure I like the move rook to d1 that much. The question is whether white can make anything of it. Anyway, black just gets on with development. Stefanova knows that she's not going to go anywhere in this position unless she castles. So bishop, e <coughs> bishop e7 makes sense. And now white puts his knight in on e5, or even her knight. Was this the next moment where white could have played b3? I think this is a move which has to be given careful consideration at all stages in this particular opening line. I like it less here, because black can put the knight on d5, and after knight takes d5, knight takes d5, um, we see the dark side of rook d1, as white has to deal with the threat of knight to c3. White's probably got to waste time with the queen to guard that square, and now black takes on b3 and castles, with unclear consequences after e4, knight f6, and then knight to e5. Here we see a typical scenario where white's dominating the centre, definitely compensation for the pawn, perhaps a bit less compensation than than in the last variation where white dispensed with rook d1 or went b3. But still not at all an easy defensive task for black 2 to eke out the extra pawn. Although it has to be said that, you know, I think black can defend this position. For instance, knight d7 looks decent, as does maybe queen to c7. Each of these moves gives black good defensive chances. And black is a pawn up. Going back, knight e5. Well, again, that's very thematic. We're expecting b3 or e4, maybe both, at any moment. So Stefan overplayed queen to b6, just protecting everything, crucially protecting that bishop on b7. And white played knight e4. It's interesting the way Stefanova's playing this game. It's almost as if she's made, letting her opponent make all the running. You know, she's grabbed this pawn. She's shown a willingness to tough it out. She's saying to White, well, you've got to prove compensation here. Is knight to e4 best? Well, White could jab at the queen with a5. That's another interesting variation. The queen's probably got to go to a7 here. That's the least exposed square. And now b3 again. Once again, I think black does best to go knight to d5, one of the knights to d5. And after knight takes d5, c takes d5. I'm doubtful that white has enough in this position. I mean, I think uh, I think black's chances of toughing this out are increasing once she gets her queenside pawns back into uh, shape. I mean, clearly, you know, black hasn't castled, white has castled. So there are always going to be some chances here. Some sort of variation like this. Bishop e3. But after queen b8, you know, black is holding on. So maybe that's why in the game, Nguyen plays uh, her knight to e4. Black went h6 to keep the knight out of g5. And now white reinforced her knight in the center with f4. And for the umpteenth time in the course of this opening, white could also have considered b3. I think White's failure to play b3 at an early stage is probably costing her the chance of advantage here. Because f4, whilst ambitious, has the downside of weakening the white king side. And this is clearly going to give black additional counterplay as the game goes on. So Stefanova rerouted her knight to d5. And now comes the move g4. We're all very well and good, but um, is the white position ready for such extravagance 
And clearly this is a, an attempt to provide a reception committee for the Black King if Black decides to castle short. But Black has other moves in this position. For instance, Black can play Rook to D8. That's one move. And she can also play as Stefano does C5. Very thematic. White plays on the flank. Black reacts in the centre. I don't think G4 is um, especially good. But of course it takes skill and experience to refute such moves. Well, let's take a look at Rook D8. Because that's the alternative to... Um, c5 as played and probably due to the pressure against e4 a uh, d4 white's got to play e3 and now black bites the bullet and castles i mean i do feel here that black has plenty of chances to defend this position for instance if white goes in with g5 we just take she recaptures and then we take again and uh i don't see where white's going with the attack that bishop on c1 blocked in the rook on a1. They take too long to get into the game. So it, it's unlikely that this attack is going to succeed. If going back, white delays the attack, just getting the bishop out. Then black could move the queen back to c7. And if h4 in this position, black can relieve the defence by taking on e4 and then taking on h4. White opens up lines for her pieces. But... um. At least here, with the help of an exchange sacrifice, black relieves the pressure. And if you run this position through the computers, you'll find that they think that black is significantly better. Exchange down, yes, but with two nice bishops and two extra pawns. Moreover, white's pawns are very shaky. But Stefan over, we can't blame her for playing her move. It looks very thematic. She hits in the center with c5 and it's around here that the initiative starts to pass to black. And once it passes, um, the white player doesn't really play so well. Well, she played knight takes c5. I'm not sure about that. Getting rid of the centralised knight, which was pretty strong. But um, after d takes c5, black would recapture with the bishop check. And then exchange off that knight in the centre. It's doubtful that after rook to d8... White has any compensation here for being a pawn down. So in the game, white takes on c5. Black recaptures and lands a check. The king goes into the corner. And now I think probably this is the only moment in the game where Stefanova misses the best move. She actually plays rook to b8. Well, that's understandable. Protecting the bishop, just getting off the a file, no tactical problems. But um, it might be worthwhile using this position as a kind of tactical training exercise what would you play as black here i think black has a strong move which stefanova didn't play can you find it well with all those white pieces clustered on the queen side um black should have been thinking about taking out the white king and if you found the best move i think h5 then well done. Yes, this is very strong. Uh, White can scarcely permit the opening of lines against her king, so she's got to push forward, and now black puts the knight in on g4. I think this would really have given White uh, insoluble problems already. But okay, Stefanova thinks I'm winning, I just want to play it safe. Rook to b8 makes sense. White plays rook to a3, and now another excellent move here c3 just an interference move destroying white's coordination and blocking out that rook on a3 so good on all counts moreover black's threatening c2 so that's why white puts the queen in the center but stefanova is now able to take on b2 and of course now we see that the position's collapsing after knight takes f4 so it's interesting once stefanova played a move in anger this move c5 White seemed to be quite unable to put up any resistance. It's so true of many many players, isn't it? You know, when they're when they're handling the initiative, when they feel they've got the upper hand in the game, they play really well. But as soon as the initiative um, is taken away from them, and especially if the game turns halfway through, their play goes completely downhill. 
And now, of course, white's got nothing better than to take on b7, allowing black to take on d3, and then we get this move bishop c6 check, which may, of course, give some compensation after king e7, rook a takes d3. I mean, it's incidentally here, I think black can play rook hd8. But in the game, Stefanova chooses something much clearer. She just re-sacrifices the queen. Queen takes c6. And now we get a flurry of tactics where actually, um, in the end, black is going to emerge material ahead. So there are two rooks on pre here. The problem is black's a piece up. White when rook c3, threatening rook takes c4. Black simply moved the rook. White could have resigned here, actually, but I suppose she felt with the black king still in the middle, there was some chance. But um, knight d6 consolidates. After rook b2, now we can say the game has, has gone. Um, white is really clutching at straws here. Stefanova finishes in a very nice way on move 31. She castles, all the better for having been delayed. And after king g2, knight gf6, everything's protected. Time for white to resign. Well, I wouldn't mind betting that many Slav games have gone like that over the years. Black's made this early capture on c4 and consolidated the game out. It's not at all easy to handle these positions with white as we've seen. Of the opening, well, I didn't really like the move a4 and Stefanova's novelty knight to a6 is definitely worthy of consideration. There weren't many points in this game at which white could have improved, but perhaps her reluctance to play the move b3 until it was too late um, cost her the real opportunity to get compensation for the pool. So I hope you enjoyed that game and thank you for viewing.